Well, welcome in everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on this snowy night in St. Louis. We are so excited. I am so excited to have this conversation tonight and Wednesday, and then next Monday and next Wednesday with people that I like to call living history. There is so much history of this great nation and of the world, of course, but I have found in my 26 years here in St. Louis and at KMOX Radio that there are people that I meet all the time who represent what I like to call living history. And so over the next four shows, this Monday, tonight, this Wednesday, and then next Monday and Wednesday, you're going to meet some of the people that I call living history. They are doing so much for themselves and their families and the community. And our first guest who, he's retired now, he is uh, just enjoying himself, uh, but he is a face that you watched for many, many years on KTVI, 20 years at Fox 2, and then a year on the radio at KFNS, and two years at KMOV, and then he spent seven years at the Missouri History Museum and has been retired since 2009. Please welcome Don Johnson to our Conversations with Living History. <laughs> Don, welcome in. Oh, Carol, thank you so much. It's just, I mean, I'm just honored that you uh, would include me in this group. I guess getting old has its advantages. Getting old and being alive. Oh, did we freeze up there? <laughs> no, you're good. You yeah, well, good to go. Say, you, know, <laughs> but, you know, hey, better to be seen than viewed. So, okay. Better to be seen than viewed. I, you know, it's, yeah, it's nice. Been, yeah. Don, <laughs> so let's start with, uh, you know, it, it's like I'm a therapist, you know. Tell me about your life growing up. I, you, you told me that you were born in 1947, oh. and I know that you went to, to Beaumont High yes. School, but what was it like growing up? Right in the 50s in St. Well, Louis? I, I can tell you this. I can tell you this. I, I, I started school uh, at Cole School, which most black people of my generation did. Because they started at Cole because that was the black school, at least in uh, in Midtown St. Louis, uh, over on Vandeventer and Enright. Uh, and uh, the school was segregated. Now, I, interestingly enough, I lived on Washington in the 4400 block of Washington at the time. And right across the street and then across the alley was the field school, but that was the white school. And I couldn't walk across the street and across the alley. I had to get on a bus at five years old. I had to get on a bus, no school buses, and ride down to Cole School. You either rode the bus, the Del Mar bus, or you or you rode the, the, the Holderman tracks. That'll that'll trigger some memories for people. You rode the streetcar mm -hmm. down to Cole School. And it and and so that was that was that was the early years. And when they when they integrated the schools, then I was able to go to field school, and I was there until 1957, when when my parents moved out as what we call then out west, out on Goodfellow Boulevard, near Goodfellow Boulevard. We lived on uh, Greer, and I went to Laclede School, and uh, again it was a gerrymandered district, so that most of the white kids who then lived in the neighborhood could go to a school with mostly white children. It was, it was all, I mean, that's the way they did it in those days. And that's what we lived with. And when you'd ask your parents about it, they'd say, you know, that's the way it is, you know, or, or they, or they were fighting in another way to try to get things changed. But, um, I'll tell you, it, it, it was, it was difficult because when you, when you were, uh, a, a minority child, uh, in a predominantly white neighborhood, going to a predominantly white school, uh, you caught a lot of flack. And uh, I mean, I can. I, there are so many anecdotes uh, regarding that. Uh, that we used to have a, a, a restaurant where you could go because in those days you could leave school, and go out for lunch. You had an hour for lunch in in, in elementary school. You go out, so you could leave, you go home, or go to a restaurant. So a friend of mine, he was a white kid. He said, "Hey, come go with me to the restaurant." So I did. I went to the restaurant with him, and I said, "Got my hamburger and all this stuff," and sat down. And about fifteen minutes after. The noon hour, a white kid got up on the table and said, "Now all the n words get out." Well, I happened to be the only black person in there, so I, I was stunned. And my How poor old were friend, you then? I, I was uh, was I let's see eleven, maybe eleven. Oh my gosh! Okay. Uh, and that wasn't the first time I'd ever run into that sort of thing. But but also 
you know, uh, when I lived on Washington, there was a restaurant over on Olive Street where my friend and my, uh, 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 again, they were, we always lived in mixed neighborhoods. They were always what they called changing neighborhoods. So my brother, my older brother and myself, we went into this particular restaurant and they, and the guys, <laughs> and we ordered Cokes and the guy said, well, I can give you a Coke talking to the white kid that was with us, but I can't give these two guys Cokes <laughs> because we were black. So, so my white friend, to his credit, uh, he said, well, I don't want one either. So we got up and left, and then on the way out the door, the kid mooned him. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's how that worked. But I mean, we, 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 you know, uh, <laughs> we had some, we have, I had, there are just so many things. People don't understand when you talk about the situation when it comes to race, especially in this city, uh, how pervasive uh, prejudice uh, was. It was, it was all over the place. You, you couldn't eat at Howard Johnson's, for example. You, could, you couldn't go into Howard Johnson's. People had to protest to get a seat in Howard Johnson's. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I grew up with. And if you went uh, below, always, oh, I don't know, if you went south. Uh, hmm? You've always struck me as a, um, uh, you know, a, a gentleman and a, and a positive person. And the things that you're describing to us could make a person angry and bitter. How did you go on to decide I'm, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to have a life for myself and not let such negativity impact you? Is, are, are we going to talk about how, how your parents were able to, to keep you and raise you? And Well, my mother was, 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 was the kind of person who, uh, she didn't really take a lot of anything off of anybody. I mean, she got you told right, right now. And, uh, and, but she also told us that it didn't make a lot of sense to get into trouble and to be into more trouble than the trouble that had already started. You know what I mean? If they started the trouble and you started punching people out, uh, you're going to be in more trouble because they're never going to believe you, you know, and I've got examples of that too, but that's, a, I mean, so to stay on a positive level, you've got to say to yourself, and I did to myself, first of all, I was a very bright kid and I said to myself, well, I'm smarter than they are. So I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And so I kept my grades up, uh, even though there were there were real conspiracies to try to keep my grades down. I actually, actually had a teacher tell me one day, because I got 100 on the test, and a white kid who was also very bright got a 99, that I couldn't have the 100 because I couldn't outdo him. Mm. I mean, actually, he actually told me that. So your question was, how, do I, how did I stay sane and gentle? Well, I did right. to a point. Right. I, did. I mean, I didn't say I never fought back, because I did. but. I also understood that you can't, you you know, you can't take on every fight every day all the time, uh, and 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 I never hated anybody. I never felt that that hate. As a matter of fact, I lived in the neighborhoods. The neighborhood I lived in, uh, we had all kinds of ethnicities there, and all kind of nationalities there, and second generations of of kids from 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 Europe and from and Jewish kids and Italians and so on. I found them fascinating because they had, they were different from me. I didn't find them as people I should dislike. I found those people I should learn something from. And and when I would go to that point, that's how I befriended them and that's how I learned about other people's cultures. You can't un, you can't learn about other people's cultures if you hate the people. That's you know? true. And, you, know, you just can't. And, uh, and and it didn't make a sense. It never made any sense to me. And when uh, the first time I ever heard certain uh, negative words about ethnic groups, I heard them from white kids. They'd call each other all these weird names, and I, I had never heard those names before, you know. So, but my attitude was was I want to learn who these people are. So I, I knew kids from the Ukraine who, whose parents had been in in the Holocaust and so on and so forth, and I, I sympathized with them and understood that. So that's that. Just as a person who wanted to learn, that really was what was was is what guided me. Now that isn't to say that when the sixties came along. And we had Malcolm and we had others who were a lot more militant that I didn't get on that bandwagon and say, wait a minute, something's really wrong here, you know, uh, because I did. But I never was able to. My mother wouldn't let me go on the freedom rides. I wanted to go and she wouldn't let me go. You know, well, a lot of black folks were very frightened of that. You know, that's 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 right. that's right. I, I, saw because, Emmett Till, I saw Emmett Till's picture in a jet magazine when I was eight years old and it haunted me for years. And so I remembered that, you know, that what had happened to that young man. And so we were terrified of going to the South. Of course, my dad was from the South. He was from, he was from Louisiana and Arkansas. 
and we had relatives of the, in the South. So, it, you know, it, it would have been very easy for me to be a nasty, uh, uh, racist bitter. person, right? A bitter right. person, because I, I, you know, these are just these are just some of the things that that I went through. You know. Um, well, Don, let me you, ask you. Yeah. Let, let me ask you about college, because people watching know they watched you for decades um, as a television news reporter and anchor. Uh, but you went to you graduated from Saint went to Saint Louis Community College, graduated from Webster, which was Webster College, now Webster University. Did you go as a journalism major or or a different major? No, I I, I went as a communications major, and uh, the thing was. Uh, I, I was a GI, so I was able to go, you know, under the GI Bill that come out uh, during the Vietnam era. So that's how I wound up at, at Webster. They had a program that, that allowed, uh, I got scholarship money and other money because I was a veteran. And that's how I got, got through Webster. But, but uh, uh, I didn't go in as a journalism major, no. But I was always a very good writer. And, I, and when I was at, when I was at uh, Forest, I went to Forest Park first, and then I went to, to Flow Valley. And uh, when I was at Forest Park, uh, a, a young woman named Kathy Dunlop, who's still who's still living over in Kirkwood, was was uh, had a newspaper and asked me what I write for it, and I did, and that's how I really got into writing, you know, for newspapers and things like that. Um, but when I was at Webster, um, the, the, the programs that they had over there, I, I, I studied a lot of film. And I studied a lot of communications, and of course, at that time we were still doing, still doing film, and still doing it. Videotape was just coming onto the scene, you know. So that's that's really how I how I learned, and I uh, TV on the fly more or less was a came. I was in radio for many years, and, and uh, that's why I have a great deal of respect for you, you know, because I know what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and, uh, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say it has been such a joy, and you know I could talk to you um, for for many many hours. But I'm so grateful to learn um, this this about you and in, in the experiences that you had growing up in St. Louis, and it has served you well. And it looks like you're enjoying retirement, Don Johnson. I am enjoying retirement. I'm telling you, it's it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> I look forward. I don't worry. Tonight is. I mean, it snowed all day. So what? <laughs> well, Don Johnson is definitely living history. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, the pleasure's mine, Carol. Anytime, anytime, just call. Absolutely. That is Don Johnson, who many of you remember from KTVI uh, for 20 years, but um, he was able to work at the uh, Missouri History Museum for seven before retiring in 2009. Don Johnson, Living History Indeed in the St. Louis area. Our next guest tonight on Living History um, is someone that I have had so much respect for for so long. She is Dr. Marty K. Casey, joining us now on Living History. Dr. Casey, unmute yourself. Uh, and tell me. Hello. How, how are, you? are you, my friend? I'm wonderful. Oh, my goodness. I was just enjoying. I was a sponge listening to Mr. Don Johnson and you. That was that was living history for me to see the two of you all engaging in the history of St. Louis and how you began your uh, phenomenal career. So thank you both for just being yeah. who you are. Let me say that I've already made a mistake because 15 minutes with somebody like Don Johnson is not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Marty K. Casey, I, I want to talk about your childhood as well, but how did you become a doctor? Well, I received an honorary doctor back in uh, 2018, but I people have been calling me Dr. Marty, if you will, for several years, just uh, many, many years, I should say, just due to the fact that I have been doing the work of... Um, if you will, be, being trauma informed or what have you for a long, long time, because I started with myself. You mentioned that you wanted to speak about my childhood. Mm -hmm. so I kind of want to just jump right into it uh, yeah. and let you know that uh, I come from a background where I had um, I had some dysfunction happening in my home uh, and not that not that I'm the only person who ever lived through a situation like that. So I'm not trying to make this a sob story or what have you, but it just happens to be my story. My father, you know, was abusive. He was battling with alcoholism and uh, seeing that abuse growing up, it affected my brother and I in some major, major ways. And I really didn't 
understand how bad it had affected me, Carol, until high school. I heard Don mention um, his grade school and high school, and I started jotting down all the schools I went to. So I want to rattle them off to you. St. Eagleburg, Skull and Holy Ghost, Mark Twain, Wedgwood, Hempstead, Stowe Middle, Riverview Junior High, Riverview High School, and then Webster Groves and Missouri Baptist College, which is now Missouri Baptist University. By the time <laughs> I reached a fresh, being a freshman in high school, I had already attended 10 different schools. Mm. So it, that, Why was that, Marty? Why was well, that? Again, it was the dysfunction that was happening in my home. And so if we if we lost, um, you know, our house and now we got to move to a different neighborhood that puts you in a different district, you're now going to a different school. And, you know, I applaud my mother who was hardworking two jobs and going to school. But after divorcing my father, which was a good decision, <laughs> it, it still affected us in some major ways. And um, so that's how I became Dr. Marty to answer your question, because I had to find a cure for myself to mentally just hold on to everything that I was dealing with. And, and let me say that because um, I know you so well, uh, I just jumped right in and started talking to you and didn't even introduce you. Oh, that's OK. Uh, <laughs> that, well, people need to know that that Dr. Marty K. Casey, people remember you uh, as an actress mm -hmm. and you have written plays. You have traveled the country in plays. Your latest creation is the Ungun Institute because you say that hurt people hurt people, but healed people can heal people and yeah. created the Black Sunday, S-O-N Day, which was a global event yeah. on August 9th, 2020, mm -hmm. 100 global networks, 50,000 people were engaged in the 12 hour interactive presentation and discussion. And I was definitely one of them. And most recently, Dr. Casey was named a top 25 most influential businesswoman in St. Louis. She is a member of the Arts and Healing Council and serves on many, many different boards. When did you start acting? When I was a little girl trying to ungun, if you will. Um, playing with my Barbie dolls and doing skits. That creative play really afforded me an opportunity to, to, to let go and release. And uh, I started developing a skill that later on showed up in my life that, that actually uh, it, it, it opened up an opportunity for me to make it a profession. And so by the time I was, I, I actually started singing, Carol, I've been singing longer professionally than anything oh. since the age of 25. I mean, since the age of 12. And so by the time I was 25, I lost my hearing in my left ear. Uh, to a rare disease called Meniere's disease. So I thought, but I want to fast forward a little bit. Mm. It's three years ago, I had to go to an ENT and they uh, actually uh, ran tests again. And the doctor said, I believe that you was misdiagnosed. You didn't have, you don't have Meniere's disease. You had a stroke at 25. Oh and my so, goodness. Yeah. So he says, what, what happened in your life that was traumatic during that time? So that's just how bad that trauma can affect us. It affects us mentally, physically, and spiritually, and you know all of the above you can imagine. So he, here I had to think back to 25 years ago, what traumatic experience happened in my life. And unfortunately, it was during a time where my, my brother had had an altercation in the community, and he had, uh, in self-defense, shot and killed a, a man. And mm. I remember... I lived through that moment. I was the first person my brother seen after he had run into the house after it happened. And, and so my life has so many experiences have How led. How old were me. you then, Marty? When, were you 25. in high school? Or? I was 25 years was old. 25. I was 25. So after I lost my hearing, I knew I wasn't going to be the next Whitney Houston. And that led me to, you know, who gave me my start? Tyler Perry encouraged me, I should say, uh, to go and audition for a community play. He was here in St. Louis doing his first show called I Know I've Been Changed. And mm -hmm. after he said to me, 
I can look at you and tell you can sing. Can you act? I said, no, I don't have any acting experience. He says, I want you to go and try out for community theater and get that experience under your belt. When I come back, I want you to audition for me. I did exactly what that man told me to do. And here I am today, a professional actress in the union. And as a matter of fact, a movie uh, that is coming out this, this month, actually is being premiered. It's being showed tomorrow and it's premiering in uh, Tennessee next week. And it is actually called The Mink Slide which is written by uh, Owen Wood and, um, and Chris Phillips is the director who's a very good friend of Amy's who's backstage right now. So yeah, <laughs> so we, it's wonderful to just uh, be in collaboration with uh, artists here in St. Louis and, can, and have an opportunity to continue to do what I do. So I've combined all of that together. So my trauma work with being an actress and showing up for the community and, and being an advocate, what does that, who, who is that or what is that? I'm an activist. This is so a new phrase that you have yeah, coined. A new phrase that I've coined. So I'm a professional actress and an activist combined. And was it Michael Brown's death that shifted you into activism? And tell us how. Well, I, I I pulled that back out of the bag, if you will, because back in Missouri Baptist University is where my activism began. I was the first black female to receive a full scholarship in music. And I was also the first black class freshman class president. And so during that time, they were not observing Dr. King's birthday. And I was like, huh, where we do that at? We in a co-ed <laughs> We in a co-ed dorm and here we are blacks and whites together. And, and so we, we still have class and it's Dr. King's birthday. This is 1990. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. We're not going to class. I shut it all down. I, I uh, taught them songs, Kumbaya, uh, the happy birthday to Stevie Wonder version. And I mean, we sang songs from our dorm to our class. And the dean of students called me in and he says, Marty, you need to get everybody back to class or you're going to lose or you or you're going to lose your scholarship. And oh I, said, well, I said, well, consider it lost. And I walked away from my full oh. scholarship at Missouri Baptist University because they were not honoring Dr. King. And this is where the new this is where the news gets worthy of telling years later when I became Dr. Marty and received that honorary doctorate, that is when they called me back and they did a big story on me. And today, if you were to call on January 15th or the, or the third Monday of the, of the month in January, they will tell you that classes are closed. That's where my activism began. So let me, let, let, let me walk <laughs> back through that. Okay. You, you are protesting at Missouri Baptist because yes. they are not recognizing Dr. King. Others are. They were not. That's correct. The dean calls you in and says, if you don't shut this down, you will lose your scholarship. That is correct. And you said, take it. It's lost. Take my scholarship. Yeah, that is correct. What did you do after you left that school? Or did you continue to go? And I, continued for, I continued for another semester. And then I, um, then I came back the following year, my sophomore year, and I was trying to do it out of pocket and it did not work. And then I, that's when I got pregnant with my daughter. So things just did not pan out the way that, you know, I thought in history it would, but sometimes we have to sacrifice something. And I, when I think about what I sacrificed way back then, it is still paying it forward for someone today including Dr. King. I mean, how, you know, really, we're not going to stop and honor the I, man that has given us an opportunity to have black and white children in the same dormitory, going to school together. That just didn't make sense to me. So I had to do something and I did. And that's pretty much how I live my life, Carol. You know that. Even right now, I am considering, I'm in prayer about uh, running for Senate. And I don't know enough about politics. I'm just being honest with you. You're hearing it here first. But this is what I see before I allow someone to take that seat that is only going to be exclusively for a small group of people and not be representative to all, then I will jump in and they will put an activist in a Senate seat because I'll run. I'll run. I'll raise money. I'll get the votes and I'll do what's necessary. And I'll learn as I go. I'll call you every day, Carol, and say, Carol, wait, what? how do I do this? T Carol, help me out. Send me some information. T put them on the line. I will work hard to make sure that we are protected. I've been doing it all my life and I doubt if I stop tomorrow. Now, see, this is why the banner says living history. 
<laughs> because this is what is happening. You know, every, every guest that, that, that we're talking to uh, is, is still yet doing things. And Don Johnson does them behind the scenes. I, 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 will, I will tell you that and be very clear about that. You wrote a play once and traveled across the country in that. You wrote yes. a play, but you traveled across the country in several other plays. That's correct. That is correct. I mean, I, I've had an opportunity to do great things. Uh, I've I've traveled the the play. One of the plays that I was in is "Be Careful What You Pray For." That that play uh, that grossed uh, 30, uh, 23, 23 million dollars. Uh, you know, uh, and the, so it was it was a, a really good play. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> even 20 years ago. And then uh, some may know me from Menopause the Musical. I was in that show for 12 years. And then I uh, got picked at up Westport. at Westport. Yeah, that was at Westport, but I also got picked up as a national actress and I and I toured that in other cities as well. And then uh, just most recently in 2018 is when uh, I had um, written and directed and produced and starred in playing set six parts of my own show, which is It's Not a Man's World in AARP right before the pandemic, uh, actually produced it and brought me out to Brooklyn, New York. And I got a chance to uh, perform that to a sold out show. The show sold out within hours. And so mm -hmm. right after that, the pandemic happened. My show was the, one of the last shows. This is history. This is history. One of the last shows to play in New York before the pandemic hit. That goes down in history. So I'm very excited about all of the opportunities that I have been given um, through, you know, so many wonderful people that see something in me. And uh, I just want to continue that. And, and before I let you go, <laughs> yeah, well, we do we do adore each other. If, before I let you go, describe what the Ungun Institute is, how it works and how people can get involved. I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm going to ask you, have you ever been through something in your life where it has caused you to just be emotionally drained and your emotions to be out of control? And that that hurt and that pain has caused you to fall back, not show up and be your best, maybe in your marriage, in your in your personal life, on your job, in your community. If you are dealing with anything like that, Ungun Institute is definitely the business that you need to be contacting so that we can help you be and live your best life. We ungun trauma is what we do. We disarm it. And I call it ungun because, first of all, there's so many of us have been affected by gun violence across the nation. All of that is traumatic. And how, where are they going to get the help? Who's going to help them? Who's going to even completely understand what they've been through? As I shared with you earlier, I've been through that same traumatic experience when a loved one in my family held a gun in his hand and had to make a choice in that moment. And I had, I still live today with the effects of it. So I understand it. And that is the reason that I have created Ungun Institute. And I'm excited to, to, to know that uh, what I have been allowed to create is helping so many people across the world, across the world. Who knew? I'm not a, I am not a therapist. I am not a medical doctor. There's so many things that I'm not, but one of the things that I can tell you I am, and I will always continue to be, I am a woman with integrity and heart, and I love my people. So Ungun Institute is here to help. Not just my people, but all people with hurt and pain. And people can get involved how? They can contact me. I'm on every social media site that they create. Uh, I don't necessarily engage all day long, but you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Clubhouse. And you can just simply, how about give me a call at Ungun Institute? And that phone number is 314 518 five five zero eight and you're going to reach me directly and from there I will put you in contact with my assistant and we will get you on the books to get you the help that you need and I just Dr. want to thank you Dr. Marty K. Casey thank you for all you do spreading I, and I mean this it sounds trite but spreading such love and joy everywhere you go that is that's just the the 
goal that you have in life. And it's just in your DNA to do that. And so we're so grateful to have you as living history in St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Blessings to you and all of your guests. I will see you soon because we are friends. So we do, we do hang out. Uh, and I, I still have a Christmas present for Dr. Marty K. Casey that I have not given to her yet. Um, our next guest uh, is someone that I've just always been, and I hope she's with us. We were having some connection issues. Um, so I hope that she's with us, is, was able to get in and involved. Um, Nicole is the co-founder of Abna Engineering. And this is a day-to-day -day company that she runs, a two-person firm uh, that began in, in a humble fashion to more than 60 professionals across two offices. She began her career at the Illinois Department of Transportation, IDOT, as we call it, where she was a resident engineer for a major roadway, major roadway and bridge construction projects. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and is a certified lead AP and is currently pursuing an urban affairs degree at Harris Stowe okay. State University. Nicole Aduwale. Is Nicole with us? Yay! I'm here. Oh, I'm so here. glad. You know, it's so it's so interesting because um Marty was in, in a meeting, you were running a meeting, our next guest was in was teaching a class. Everybody's very, very active. So thank you so much for your time. I'm so glad we were able to connect. Anything for you, Carol. <laughs> well, I, I am I like I said, I have always been so in awe of what you have been able to accomplish. So you're, you're a 10 year old girl, Nicole. Do you know as a 10 year old girl, are you saying in the mirror, Nicole, you're gonna own a business. You're gonna bid on multi-million dollar contracts and you're gonna get them. Nicole, you're gonna marry the love of your life. You're gonna have a wonderful family. Are you telling yourself that as a 10 year old, Nicole? Some of that actually, yes. So when I grew up on, Ebony and Essence magazine. And I will always look at the pictures of, you know, the, the millionaires and the society people, but also my grandmother, Maddie Mae Hutcherson and her husband, Booker T. Hutcherson had a little store at uh, Jefferson and Thomas. So I did always have an interest in becoming an entrepreneur. I, um, at the age of about 11, I started dreaming about becoming an architect. I got into um, the inroads program. Hi, Mr. Dixon, if you're watching, uh, who I now <laughs> serve on a board with, I got into inroads at the age of 15. And yes, there I crafted the vision of owning a company that would work on government contracts in civil engineering. So your grandparents are business owners. So you, you're, you see it in your life. Yes. In, in your neighborhood, are people saying, your friends, are they saying, girl, you're crazy? No, it, it wasn't something that I really vocalized with anyone mm. in particular. It was just a, it was just a dream that I kind of kept to myself and just considered. And it probably became more real once I got into inroads. And then when I did meet the love of my life, uh, that vision became brighter and brighter. Where did you go to high school? I went to the University City High School, yes, where also all four of my children have attended, three have matriculated, one is a junior. Now, so you you are at the, the University City High yes. School. Is college a foregone conclusion? Yes, uh, I was fortunate. Because that's what Inroads, that's what Inroads does for everyone who's involved. You, you have a goal. Let's discuss what the goal is and then we're gonna help you achieve it. Yes, I think they helped me submit where I was going to go. However, uh, fortunately, even though I'm only the second generation to attend college, um, my parents did attend college. Most of their friends, my mother's sorority sisters, my dad's fraternity brothers, a lot of their friends were um, college graduates or professionals. And so uh, it was it was a foregone conclusion. Plus, I had a wonderful high school counselor, the late Patricia Perryman, uh, who was also a sorority sister. She really she made sure she helped me fill out all my applications. She 
made sure I went to all of the college interviews. And she's actually the one that got me into inroads. And Nicole, you you are younger than I am, I, I think. Am I wrong? I'm a little 58. Bit. Okay. Yeah, I'm well, six years younger. You, you, so well, you're way you. younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I, I, I asked that, and I thought you were, but I didn't know your exact age. But I asked that because our generation certainly has a different sense than what our, our first guest, Don Johnson, was talking about going to high school in the 60s. Um, yes. So our generation, you know, we definitely had a different sense of what we could accomplish, would you say? I, I would agree. And where did you end up going to college? And was it exactly what you thought it was going to be? Or, or were there hurdles? Of, look, I love that face. Hurdles along the way. <laughs> It was harder than I expected. I went to the Georgia Institute of Technology or Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Um, I majored in civil engineering and it was it was very tough. When I went to orientation, they did say, look on your left, look on your right. The person who's here may not be with you uh, in, at the end of the four years. I, you know, I have seen that done at, at medical schools. That happens, uh, um, you know, the first year of residency. I've seen that happen, but I didn't know it happened in in in, in engineering. But that is a high powered school, so I, I certainly get it. Yes, yes, um, and and there were while there were supports in place to um, to help us, uh, there were there were programs for minority students, first time students. But it was really the elite of the elite. And so coming out of U City High School, I was in the top 10 percent of my class, made great grades. And you go to Georgia Tech and you are average. Mm. Well, now you are the owner. How, how old is Abna now that you and your husband, Abe, own? It is 26 years. 20. Wow. So when I first moved oh. here, I met you and the company... Is oh, that I'm, right? I'm can, sorry. Can you it'll be 20, 26 years. It'll be 27 in June. We were founded in 1994. I had to do the math. Yeah. Yeah. 27 okay, in okay, June. Okay. Yeah. So we, we probably, when we, when you, when you came and I think we probably met maybe eight to 10 years after you got here. Mm -hmm. And so tell us what the company does and how successful you are. We are, well, I'm very blessed. So let's start with that. Uh, we are a full service civil engineering company. We design roads, bridges, sewers. We also um, develop uh, campus plans for um, universities, for school districts, um, for um, co commercial entities. Probably our, our largest clients are uh, the Illinois Department of Transportation, the Missouri Department of Transportation, MSD, and a number of universities. Um, probably the most recognizable thing is that for the last 10 years or so, we have um, inspected nearly all of the interstate overhead signs in the throughout the state of Illinois. And tell us why that's necessary. It's necessary. A lot of people just think of those signs as just, you know, wayfinders to get where they go, but those are actual structural members. So it's important to uh, inspect those signs to make sure that they don't have any failures and they don't fall down on your car. And you have how many employees because you're changing lives in that way? We're, we're right at about 60. We had a general contracting division for a while and we've had as many as 100 employees, but we, uh, we, we let go of that and now we're down to 60, but we're planning to build back up uh, this year. And, and before I let you go, um, people, because of the vice president, Kamala Harris, are hearing the name Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated more now than ever before. Of course, I, I, and I'm not a sorority member, but because I went to college, I, I am aware and I went to an HBCU. So I'm def a historically black college and university. So I'm definitely aware. Um, why did you join the sorority and, and what has it done for your life? Thank you for that question. So I am a 25 year member 
daughter of a 50 plus year member, mother of a seven year and two year member respectively. Um, it provides a platform for serving the community. It also provides opportunities for leadership and, um, and, and just meeting other women from different walks of life. Uh, I have enjoyed my, my um, now, I have to get the, the number straight this year. I think it is uh, 28, 29 years of service actually. Um, and I'm looking forward to more. And I've met so many wonderful people, not just in my sorority, but there's a network of people in the Panhellenic uh, Society that, you know, you get to interact with members of Delta Sigma Theta and Sigma Gamma Rho and Alpha Phi Alpha. And a lot of people wonder, is there some elitism to it? But there's a lot of service. There's a lot of sacrifice of your time, your talent, your treasure that is required of you to be a part of that organization. I love it. Um, six or seven of my family members, um, th I have three cousins who are also members of the sorority, uh, two here, one in Chicago. Uh, so it, it has been a supreme blessing to, to serve the community uh, through Alpha Cap Alpha sorority. And through ABNA Engineering and through your life as a wife and a mother, I know that that is that you have a heart of service and being a wife and a mother is all a part of that. Nicole Aduale, it is so good to talk to you and to see your lovely face. Thank you so much. And when this pandemic is over, drinks are on me. Thank you. And I'm pleased that next up is my soror, Amy. So <laughs> please tell her I said hello. You, you, you pick some excellent guests. You have great friends. And thank you so much for engaging me this evening. Nicole, you are truly living history. You know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a wonderful evening and be safe. Um, well, I did not know that they were sorority sisters. Let me say that. <laughs> we wrap up this first um, evening of our living history conversations uh, with a woman that I met when I was um, first covering, you know, news about the YWCA. She at that time was the director of racial justice for the YWCA of St. Louis. She uh, has gone on to do different things, but her impact on this community is still very, very real. She is Amy Hunter, who joins us next on Living History on KMOX. Amy, unmute yourself, and uh, let me just say again that I did not realize that you, I should have known, I should have <laughs> known, but I, I, I wasn't thinking about that, that, <laughs> that you no were worries. in the <laughs> I know, right? So, yeah. so you, you were at Boeing, am I right? Oh, yeah. I've been a lot of places. So I left the Y and went to St. Louis Children's Hospital. What a great job, you know, to work in healthcare. Nice blends there as well. Um, left uh, Children's Hospital after just two years and went to Boeing. Was there for two years. And now I work at Calaris. So from uh, babies to planes to shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we, we, we need to talk. Uh, yep, about your current shoe job, um, but you are the, the the vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And before we talk about your current work and even that work that goes back to the why, I, I do want to take a step back and 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 talk about how and and Amy Hunter gets to the point where her life's work is about racial justice, diversity, uh, and and equity. You know, does that start when you're a teenager or, or is it because of your parents? Tell me. It's so I would even say, let's see, my grandmother's mother helped register people to vote. My grandmother was a politician. My mom was an educator. My dad used to be the head of Missouri something, something. It's the uh, in between minority businesses and major corporations. So he was the hookup guy. Um, which I actually didn't know until he died. He was 50 when he died. I had no idea what my dad did for a living. A lot <laughs> he was of people, my yeah. dad. <laughs> I was like, well, there are a lot of people here. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> what did he do again? Yeah. But, you know, that's, I mean, I think it speaks volumes to my family members and uh, their commitment to the community and making a difference very humbly, um, but making a difference like every single day. Like, so it's, it's in my DNA for sure. Yeah, it's in St. Louis blood. Yeah. You know, but but such it's it is that's no but. And 
it is a very broad, the, the work is very broad. Some people focus in the voting lane, some people in the women's rights lane, some people even in health care for the immigrant community. Um, so there are lots of different lanes. How did you narrow that down for yourself? Yes, I mean, racism's everywhere. <laughs> so you don't really have to pick a lane. Uh, just pick a, you know, career to do it. I actually got talked out of it. I used to be the uh, vice president of diversity for Bank of, Bank of America. So worked at the Urban League right out of college, thought I would never leave, loved that job, to worked for Mr. Buford. I loved the Urban League. I loved, they brought chicken and, and spaghetti for my birthday. Like I thought I would never leave ever. <laughs> Um, and uh, had really great Adrian Gaines, great mentor there, left, went to corporate America. At the cafeteria workers greeted me because they were the only black people there besides myself at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they gave me great advice. And then shortly thereafter, Yvonne Sparks and Val Patton joined, um, oh. and they were like my mentors. Yes, absolutely. They I got me the two. job, right? So yeah. they talked to the president and said, hey, we, we have this great person who should lead your diversity efforts. I was 26, I think. <laughs> I had been a recruiter for a whole year, took the job pregnant, and um, my then boss actually told me I shouldn't have a career doing that. So I left Bank of America to get out of diversity work, went to Monsanto, and um, did their university recruiting, uh, which was their diversity strategy. So it's like, you know what? I might as well just do this. Do this. Um, Be in yeah. this lane. Yeah, just this is what I'm going to do. Even if I don't want to do it, I'm going to do it. Has your view of it changed over the years of, of what the needs are or what the problems mm. are? Yeah. Um, so it, because I've been in so many industries, I've gotten to see how connected they are. Um, so I think I was, when I was a young person, if you met people who knew me when I was young, I was very worried that it would not happen. I was, I, I kind of always spoke with this very impatient kind of tone um, that we have got to get this done. You know, my people, my people, my people. Um, and so I was very urgent, uh, very unapologetic in the way that I said things. Uh, now I've, I've softened it a bit, but really that's because Ferguson happened. It gave me joy to see young people protesting around issues of race and racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. I felt like at the time, this would be our Brown versus the Board of Education so that if we could change it in policing, we could change it in schools and in healthcare, and the ripple would be there. I don't necessarily disagree that it's a ripple. I, th I think that it is, right? So I think what happened with George Floyd would not have happened without Ferguson. Black Lives Matter started after Ferguson, well, before and after Ferguson. So um, I'm, not, I'm not scared that people aren't clear anymore. Um, and so getting people organized is you know, kind of the work now in all systems but yeah you, there's there's an equity everywhere and and have you found yourself do you surround yourself with the village because i would imagine that the work it's either edifying i'm sure it is edifying but that can also be draining and then one can all can say okay i i you know i just i can't i can't do it i can't do it anymore and so for that not to happen the village around you has to be you know, a citadel. Um, so how have you maintained and, and, and become one who was able to soften and, but still be so powerful and intentional? Yes, yeah, so I definitely have. Um, so great family support. I've got a great sister, great brothers. I have cousins that I can talk to, right? I have so many really good friends. I also have a network of um, African-American people that I talk to and kind of decompress with. So Rudy Nickens, for example, Maxine Birdsong, Mary Ferguson, who took my job at the YWCA. Like really good friends um, that I can talk to kind of on an ongoing basis. Like, can you believe this? Like just have that moment to get it up off and sometimes even cry about because I think if you just keep holding it in like I don't know you're gonna Not explode good. or implode or something so I like I try to cry at least once a week you know there's always something to go there there's if you care you know if you are in touch with your own feelings there is enough weeping to heal that needs to get done in order to continue doing the work and you also have to like have mad like faith that this is going to get better. Like I have stood in my dining room, you know, and pounded my foot and said, you can't have this. Like we're not, it's gonna work, you know? And um, to to living this living history, like we we are living the history. Like that is the also joy 
right? Of being like, wow, we were there, like that happened. And we were like there and that that really did happen. And like, then that happened. And um, so I very optimistic that this will change in my life. Like we already seen like a black president and a black vice president. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but my list was like, eh, and now it's like, eh, so mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> Let's um, do this. I- I'm so I'm so curious too because you you I, I read your words on Facebook um, I, I I ingest your words on Facebook and you just made me think of of our thoughts as living history that you're at you are you're there for many events and you're speaking and you're marching and you're writing but but you are helping people to to change their thoughts and our thoughts are a part. Of living history, do, do you do you see that? Do, I I know that you, you know you you have we have to have a heart change, mind change before we have action change. Yeah, I mean I think um, sometimes my, I my my life changed though, right? Like like I went from being a single mom to kids who were out of college, and, and you know like that time sometimes helps with like what you think is possible. Um, usually, if it's an early post, it I. You know, I woke up with it on my mind and I was just getting it out on Facebook. I've heard from other people that was helpful, but I feel like, um, you know, life is to be given away. <laughs> you know, it's, it isn't mine. Somebody, I was just talking to somebody and I said, yeah, I have the talk. I, I did that after three days after my grandma's skill. I was like, who knew it would make the wire and make news and be a thing, right? I should have named it something sexy. And um, <laughs> like somebody was like, oh, you should trademark that. You know, I was like, well. I mean, I don't really think I can own, you know, something that happens to black people all the time. Now, I kind of wish I had because I'd be like super rich, but um, or like Kimberly Crenshaw dope or something like that. But I, you know, that's a conversation that's always happened. I don't own that. Yeah. What, what is one of the last times we well, this wasn't the last time, but we saw each other at, at, at a luncheon and you said to me that you were doing work. around. And I've used this ever since you told me. OK, you told me okay. that you were studying. Yeah, I know. You were studying the the notion that when teachers found out that students were from single parent homes, black oh. students were from single parent homes, that they they their ex they lowered their expectations and they began to treat them differently. Yeah. And you told me that you were studying that. Yeah. And and I have talked about that since then because it was a notion that I didn't even know existed. Yeah, Are you still yes. studying it? I am. I, I so right before this call, I'm taking 12 hours a semester trying to finish my PhD and write my dissertation finally. Um, but it is it's got critical race theory as its base. So um, Trump made that you know more popular for people who had never heard of crit- critical race theory. I mentioned it in my TED talk six years ago um, as my foundation, and then I read Isabel Wilkerson's book Cast. So it really helped me further explain like this whole. Um, black motherhood and how your children inherit your status. And if we mm-hmm. added on the caste system, yeah, and the system of education, like this becomes even more important. And I'm going to interview moms who have been ha- have been able to navigate the educational system, really kind of as a a book to help other black women advocate for their children in the system of education, regardless of their status. So yeah, hopefully I'll be done uh, in about. A year and a half. So, and and so the the notion exists. The behavior exists amongst educators. Yeah, because most educators are they be, they just happen to be Caucasian women. But what yeah. you have already found is that that behavior exists once teachers find out about the, their parenting status of of, of their students. Yeah, I, well, I didn't just dream that. That really is what you said to me, and yeah. it really is true. Yeah, it really. Is. I mean, there. Yes, yes, we can actually gauge lots of things based upon the mother's education. But I think what's troubling you is the yes. judgment placed on a child, yes. on an adult in their lives who loves them more than any teacher could ever love them. I might add, right? Um, of like, and that that happens in a place where kids should be safe. And I would just That's offer, yeah, because they're kids. I said the same thing when I went to the hospital. I was like, these are babies. Like, you know, uh, babies come with parents, though. And but you so said you would offer. You would offer. Yeah, that absolutely happens. And like, and it doesn't have to happen. But we have to have a conversation around 
the, the status of black women in America and how that narrative gets teased out about who we are when we walk into a space based upon lots of factors. Uh, Melissa Harris Perry talks about it being a crooked room. So we're always being compared to kind of a white middle class mom and what that looks like. Now, the truth is, most parents don't really help their kids with their homework. That's what's true. Most parents don't help. But the, there's this whole narrative around when something goes wrong with our children, like it has to be the fault of a mom in particular, um, because we know what people look like when they, when like a single dad comes to school, people like stand on ceremony, like, oh my God, he's such a good person. He's taking care of his children. He brought him to school. I was like, do we? I don't think, I don't think we're going to get that. <laughs> I don't, I don't think. Nobody, nobody's standing on chairs when I drop my kid off, you know, uh, but let their dad drop him off. Oh my gosh, he's such an amazing, I'm like, no, he's a parent. Like, this is what parents do. But I, I think that gets, feeds into, like, as we did the mother to mother um, right. thing with you, right, right after Ferguson, that was the first time white women had ever seen me as a mother. Wow. Right. Wow. So they were like, oh, wait, you're a mom. I'm a mom. I'm like, oh, now we're moms together. That's what's up. Okay, because you've never really, we've never had a mom to mom conversation. And they could see the comparisons of like what it was like for a black mom to have to give their kids a talk and white moms didn't have to do that. You know, ultimately, my goal in life would be for women to work collectively across oppression, right? Like that, you want to, Carol, what's your jam, Amy? That would be my jam. Like <laughs> women, let's mm. work together for children. Yeah. Because it would be, be cool. powerful. It would be um, it would be transformational. We could right. solve so many other issues. Women are so smart and we're so organized and so loving. Like we have nothing to lose by doing this, but like we would gain miles and miles of empathy and brilliance and just love, just plain old love and for our community. And yeah. love and change. Because I've I've wondered then you know it's 802 and I'm getting into this deep, deep topic, but I've wondered is anybody studying the connection between white supremacy and sexism and that to women who follow white supremacy or follow racism or racist, that there is sexism all wrapped up into that. And I want to say to them, my sister, come back and let me help you. Let yeah. me protect you. Uh, but, you know, I'm not in that lane. So <laughs> yeah, no, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you are. Maybe you are. Yeah, you know, maybe. So you're going to be Dr. Hunter soon. Just call me finished, Carol. Just call me finished. <laughs> I, I'm in too far. Up a little bit. What now. am I going to call you? Finished. <laughs> just call me finished. <laughs> you can keep all the other titles. I just just call me done. finished. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm yeah. going to call you living. I'm going to call you living history. Hey. And um, hey. I, I'm. It's been such a joy to talk to you. I, I thought I'd consider a success when all of these people that I know that I've interviewed that I've gone to dinners and fundraisers and whatever with and had at my home even, um, and you can come to my home, is that Thanks. that I would learn something new about them. And I and I absolutely have done that tonight. And Amy, next, uh, this Wednesday, we're going to have um, the Hair Whisperer. She is a sister who created a hairline, and many, many women have. Kathy Conley Jones. Oh, I love CPJ. her. Yeah, we do love her. Tammy Holland. Oh, we of course we love her. She was at, at one point. She's doing you know that work again, but people listen to her on the radio in the morning for for, for a very long time. And Kevin McKinney, um, who was oh, in the construction. Yes, yes. So we have a great show this Wednesday for Living History, and I hope that you will join us, Amy. Thank you so much. I will be back. For your, thank you, your Carol. time and your words of wisdom, and for your work in the community. You are living history, Amy. You are too, Carol Daniel. Thank you so much for the invitation. This has been a treat. You are welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much, Amy Hunter. And thank you all for joining me tonight. We will be back Wednesday at 7 p.m. again with our guest, Tammy Holland um, and Kevin McKinney, Kathy Conley Jones, and the Hair Whisperer. You will not want to miss that show. Living History, Wednesday at 7 p.m. right here on KMOX and Facebook Live. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Be safe.